Welcome to True Paranormal, the podcast with your host, Leo Rizzuti. Every week we will explore such topics as ghosts, demons, poltergeist, haunted history, time shifts, cryptozoology, and other aspects of the paranormal through listener-submitted accounts, documentary studies, and interviews with the investigators that dedicate their lives to searching for proof of the unknown. So get a fresh cup of coffee, dim the lights, relax, and get ready for a short visit to the realm of the true paranormal. Hi guys, Leo Rizzuti here. Welcome to another episode of True Paranormal, the podcast. This is episode number five, and hey, this is, looks like it's becoming kind of a habit with you guys, getting together like this week to week. Appreciate all you guys tuning in to us. Uh, this is Thanksgiving weekend, and hope you guys all had some great Thanksgiving feasts. Got your fill of turkey and stuffing and cranberry sauce and pumpkin pie, or in my case, apple pie, because to me, pumpkin pie is of the devil, and it will never touch my lips. Uh, sorry, all you pumpkin pie lovers out there, but hey, that just means more for you guys, right? <laughs> uh, this is uh, the weekend also that I spent uh, doing all the leaves in my mother and father-in-law's yard, and I will tell you they have all the leaves in the state of Ohio seems to collect in their yard every single year. So if uh, if any of you guys are in the uh, market for 17,000 pounds of wet, soggy, uh, old maple and oak tree leaves, I know exactly where you can get them. They are sitting by the side of the road, and I can point you in that direction. So they're just waiting for some ambitious person who decides that they need all this compost material to just come and snatch it right up. So give me a call, and I can hook you up there. (laughs) At any rate, guys, let's go ahead and jump right into the show. We've got three great stories from our listeners this week to share with you. So here we go. Our first story comes from... Carrie, and she has entitled it Experiences in Two States. Okay, Carrie, let's see what you've sent us. We've had two experiences with ghosts. The first time was in Kentucky. We lived in an apartment. It started about three months after I became pregnant with my first child. I'd be standing at the sink and feel a tug on the back of my shirt, or maybe the lights would flicker every now and then. I blew it off thinking it was probably nothing. Then I started hearing distinct footsteps, sometimes upstairs, sometimes coming down the stairs. I was the only one in the house at the time. A short time later, we got a dog. I noticed no matter how much you begged, the dog would not go into our spare bedroom. This room was always noticeably cooler than the other rooms in the house. One night, I walked into the spare room, and there was an ink pen lying on the dresser, and it started spinning in circles. That's when it really began. At night, I would be awakened by noises. Our room was right next to it. I would hear someone walk across the floor and come right up to me, yet no one was there. We had hardwood floors, so footsteps were easy to hear. One day, as I was in the kitchen peeling potatoes, the coffee maker came on. It wasn't plugged in. The knife that I had been using was laying about four feet away from me and started sliding across the counter to me. One night as I and my husband were sitting in the living room, I felt my hair being pulled. Next, it, whatever it was, pulled a handful right from the top of my head and dropped it on the floor in front of me. I would feel someone touch me as I was in the shower, but my husband would be at work and there was no one else in the house. Then I started having the dreams. They were about a man. He had red eyes and was sitting behind a candle flame. I would once in a while catch a glimpse of a newspaper that he was reading, but couldn't read the headline. I would hear a woman named Julie talk to me. She would warn me to go, that I was in danger. She was always very sad. Sometimes she was crying. After several weeks, I dreamed more and more, sometimes unable to wake up easily in the morning. The dog would have unexplainable barking spells, as if maybe he saw someone. I figured out that the man in my dreams, our ghost, had killed his wife, Julie, after she had lost their baby. This was the headline in the newspaper. Evidently, because I was pregnant, he didn't want me to have a child either. 
I was given a cross that had been blessed by a priest, and the hair pulling and touching stopped. The noise in the spare room, however, didn't. One night, when we knew it was in the room, we closed the door and hung a cross on the doorknob. It evidently trapped it in there. The noise was so bad at times, we ended up sleeping downstairs on the floor. My husband went in the room and burned some sulfur after opening the window. I heard screaming coming from clear downstairs, and then it left. All was normal after that. The second time was in Colorado. After November, I started catching a glimpse of something out of the corner of my eye. I figured maybe it was my daughter, who at the time was three. She was always on the move. We left for vacation on the 17th of December and were gone for 15 days. When we returned, my daughter would say she had been in her room playing with a little boy. I assumed that it was her boy baby doll or maybe an imaginary friend. A few nights later, she had been in bed for about a half an hour, and she came out of her room screaming and was white as a sheet. She said that there was a boy ghost in her room and it was getting into her bed. It had told her that it was mad that she had left for so long. I walked right into her room, hoping to prove her otherwise. I walked around the corner, and there was this little boy appearing, maybe three or four years old or so, standing in front of my daughter's closet. It made the awfulest face and was dripping wet. My first reaction was to throw things at it. Big mistake. That just made it mad. It disappeared, and my husband came in. We exited the room, and my husband came into the living room and sat down at the computer. He got an uneasy feeling and said the hairs on his neck and arms were standing straight up. He said, Okay, it's here beside me now. My daughter was shaking and let me tell you, I was not far from a nervous breakdown. It continued to bang on the walls, scream and move things in my daughter's room. My husband hung across from a string right in the doorway after it went back into her room and it didn't come out. That night, I didn't get much sleep. Between my three-year-old and my ten-month-old waking up and screaming and all the noise in my daughter's room, it was really rather nerve-wracking. The next day, it screamed louder than any child I have ever heard. Someone told me to confront it and talk to it and ask it who it was and what it wanted and then ask it to leave. It just appeared to pout. I started questioning my daughter about it, asking if she had seen it before and she said, Oh yes! He plays with me sometimes and tries to sleep in my bed at night. She said that he got mad when she wouldn't let it in her bed and it scared her, which in turn was what made her come out of her room screaming. She told me that it had taken some of her toys and she couldn't find them. Anyway, my mother-in-law sent me a little poem to say and said to put bay leaves in the four corners of the house to keep it out whenever it was gone. The poem involved putting a drop of olive oil in the door frame and saying that by the power of God we want all evil banished from here. We haven't heard from it since, but all of my daughter's toys suddenly reappeared in the top of her closet, far out of reach. Wow, Carrie, that was an incredible story. Uh, that is amazing that you had that much activity in two different locations uh and it sounded like you know there weren't even related activities so it's not like something was following you just happened to land in two really active spots uh the first one that's i don't know if you got that story from as far as the husband killing his wife from research that you did or if it was just a feeling but that's incredible that that you would tie that into you know you being pregnant at the time uh which oftentimes will set up a haunting uh, i have seen instances where folks are pregnant and there have been pregnancy related hauntings there and they will always kick up in those times not, not only because the spirits are manifesting around what's happening to you but then also there's a lot of times where the energy from pregnant uh, ladies will be so strong and so palpable that spirits can feed off of that by itself and make them stronger. The other one, uh, that's incredible, the full-bodied apparition, and it sounds like you saw the full-bodied apparition a couple of different times. Uh, the fact that it can be trapped in a room says to me that maybe it's not a ghost, maybe it's something other than a ghost, uh, which is a whole nother step 
scary than what you were talking about. But at any rate, looks like you got out of there, which is probably the best thing you're, you could have done, and or that you haven't had any activity there since. So whatever you did to solve it, looks like it might have solved it. I hope for your sake that it has and that you guys are at peace now uh, and that you guys are safe. Again, thanks though for, uh, for sharing with us, Carrie. That was an incredible story. Our next story comes from Steve. Steve sent us something and he has entitled it Our Haunted House. Okay, Steve, let's have a go at this. When I was about six or seven, I lived in a house that was about 60 years old. It was a great house, and my siblings and I still talk about it. Recently, however, we all discovered that we had seen and heard things in the house that the others hadn't known about or experienced. On one occasion, it had been raining at night, and I had been in the kitchen when I heard noises coming from inside the floor. I laid down on the floor and listened to the sounds to see maybe where they were coming from. We had a cellar directly under the kitchen and it sounded like someone was walking around down there. Now none of my family had been down there as it was raining and my parents kept the cellar locked at all times. When I told my older sister to listen, she said she couldn't hear it. On another occasion, it had also been raining when my sister heard footsteps outside near the cellar. She had turned the lights on in the backyard, but wasn't able to see anything, although she could still hear someone walking around near the cellar for a few more moments. My dad also told us that one night while he was laying in bed at about 2 or 3 a.m., he had heard someone walking in the hallway and dragging something that sounded like chains on our wooden floors. When he got up to look, he couldn't see anything, and the floor was fine. The last thing I remember living in that old house was seeing a face in the bathroom window. It had been there for quite a few months. I was the only one that could see it, apparently, and it wasn't a scary face. In fact, it just stared into the bathroom. But being a child, I tried to debunk it as best I could. There was nothing outside that was casting shadows or lights onto the window. I tried several theories, but I couldn't understand why it was there. One day, it simply disappeared. Not sure why, but I never saw it again, and my family thought at the time I had made it up. Today, that house is still there, even though we aren't, and is now 91 years old. Wow, Steve, that was an incredible story. I love these little compact, almost like bullet stories that we get from uh, listeners every once in a while. That's really, really cool. Love the long ones too, but the short ones are really, really neat. Uh, You can pack a lot of experience into just a few short paragraphs. And this is one of those examples. Uh, Sounds like you guys had a lot of activity. And a lot of times with hauntings, you said that you guys have been talking and that one person experienced something, another person experienced something, but you never really experienced things together. And we see that a lot of times where it's almost like spirits want to divide you up so that maybe it looks like you're a crazy person. No, you're a crazy person. No, you're lying. Uh, things like that. So that there's never really any rationale to it. Uh, it's kind of weird and, uh, unfortunate that that happens because it really takes away from some of the credibility. When you try to tell somebody about it, you'd say, Hey, this happened to me. Did anybody else see it? Well, no, I was in the house by myself. So, you know, it, it is what it is, but at any rate, uh, some really cool activity that you had there, um, didn't sound like it was anything particularly dangerous, a little bit weird with the, uh, the person walking down the hall, dragging chains. That's, that would not be something that I think I would want to wake up to under any circumstances. Uh, but at any rate, I appreciate you sharing your story with us, Steve. Thanks a lot. Okay, our last story comes from Brenda, and she sends us a story that she has entitled it, Things Happened Slowly at First. Okay, Brenda, here we go with your story. Imagine what it would be like to sit in your living room with your entire family and hear someone walking around upstairs knowing nobody is there. Imagine seeing black shadows in one and three-dimensional form starting around your walls and furniture. In July of 1996, this is how it all began in our house. It was weird. We tried to reason that a stray animal or something had maybe gotten into the house. We passed a large cat-like thing on the stairways, in the kitchen, living room, and all upstairs rooms. 
Eventually, we realized that this was not a stray animal, but perhaps an animal that was only with us in spirit form. It began in about mid-July 1996. We, my husband, myself, and our son and two daughters, had lived there since June 1st of 93, and had never had anything out of the ordinary happen. My oldest daughter and I, being the only two in the house that were awake, heard three light knocks on the bottom of our front storm door. This is usually an indication that our big gray tiger cat wants in. Our cat was nowhere to be found, but I really believe that that is the night that I let the first one in. About two hours after the door incident, both my daughter and I heard someone walking around upstairs in the landing. We checked to make sure nobody had gotten up, but they were all asleep. This was only the beginning. Thinking back to that time so long ago now, I would have never imagined this thing happening to us. Things were slow happening in the beginning, when I think back. It's like they maybe wanted to break us in slowly, so as not to raise any suspicions. Occasional footsteps sounding in the upstairs landing, catching glimpses of the shadow cat, as we began calling it. The thing, maybe, when we were in a rush for words. These first incidents could be explained away in the beginning but the only ones who really saw the black shadow cat were myself and my daughters. My husband and son thought we were losing our minds, especially me. It seemed like the events would happen for about three months at a time, and then stop for as many as two or three months before starting up again. Each time, when they would begin again, it seemed as if they were more active than the time before. By the third appearance of the footsteps, we began seeing large black shadows darting quickly across rooms, usually the dining room and upstairs landing. We began feeling as if we weren't alone and were being watched constantly. My husband and son, who were by this time believers as they had actually experienced seeing the black cat, were not able to question the two girls and me anymore about our sanity. My husband and myself had both had experience with the black cat in which it actually touched us. It woke me up in the middle of the night by jumping on my chest, and I could sense that it was playing, as I could hear the faint tinkle of a cat collar bell running away from me as I sat up very quickly. My husband had a similar experience one morning when he believed it was trying to wake him up to take our son to work. The only difference is, he awoke to see it sitting on the edge of the bed looking at him, and then it lunged forward and whipped by his head. He is still amazed by the force it felt when it flew past him. On several occasions, we've had pounding, hard pounding, on the back doors. The pounding has woken us up in the wee hours of the night. When you go to see what's going on, it will stop, and nothing's there. Our youngest daughter, who was only about eight years old in the beginning, has actually been able to touch the shadow cat. Being only eight, we didn't tell her what we thought was happening in the house. One morning, as she was getting ready for school, she looked up from the couch and saw a I will give my daughter's exact wording here, brownish blackish cat sitting on the front of the desk in the living room. She got off the couch and went over to it, bent to pet it, and her hand went through it and then disappeared. She then came screaming into the kitchen where I was busy with breakfast dishes to tell me what had just happened to her. I asked her what it felt like and she said it made her hand tingle and the hairs on her hand stood up. She also said that the cat itself looked black but it had kind of a brown outline that had little squiggly things moving around in it. An amazing description for an eight-year-old, I thought. Of course, assuming that the squigglies were maybe energy moving around the cat. I didn't panic too much until the shadows became more than just the cat. When I began seeing shadows over six feet tall, it became a little unnerving. We didn't get the internet until February of 1997, so by that time, I was just glad to be able to communicate with others who had believed and had some experience with this sort of phenomenon. Over the last few years, we have seen eight different ghosts, black shadows, and other things. We've had them breathe in our ears. My son's bed was shaken one night. The footsteps on the landing and on the stairs continued, and the black cat seemed to disappear when the larger shadows began appearing. There were days I would be home alone, you know, the kids in school and husband at work, and I could hear the upstairs being just torn apart. And yet when I'd go up, nothing would be out of place. It sounded like a large version of the black cat was playing up there. I can tell you that in seeing the many different ghosts here, they don't usually have a defined face. 
It's more like the shape of a head, but with misty features. Even the cat was only clearly discernible by the shape of its body and its ears at first. But today, years later, when I see the cat on occasion, it has been in full color and has had its features, as if it's maybe stronger or something, but you can still see right through it. It was under the desk in the living room just weeks ago, and it startled me because I had just been playing with our cat outside about ten minutes before seeing it, and it took me a few minutes to realize that it was the ghost cat. Last summer, we quit seeing the ghosts as much, but other things came to light. They now make lots of noises. Less footsteps, but we can hear things maybe under our bed ruffling around at night. We hear them in between the walls upstairs. They seem to be walking around in them. They speak to us in familiar voices, such as family members' voices or friends that maybe visit frequently. And it's oftentimes very eerie, especially when you're alone. Also, we have smells now. We didn't experience them in the beginning. The worst is what we call the cigar smoker, because he will approach you and blow the smell of cigars full into your face at full force. We also smell a flowery scent from time to time, and cigarette smoke. One in particular, which is the absolute worst, is what we call the pig farmer. It smells just like someone rolled around with pigs and then came into the house. This smell only appears in the living room. The others can be smelled anywhere in the house except the kitchen. The kitchen, for some reason, seems to be a safe haven from our visitors. We have had numerous objects go missing for days and weeks, only to have them return close to where they disappeared from, but never in the exact same spot. Some items have never been found to this day. The weirdest thing that has happened to date is the evening that my oldest daughter came to me, white as a freshly bleached sheet, and said, Mom? That thing just took my putty right out of my hand and it vanished into thin air. At the time, my daughter was 16, just about a month away from her 17th birthday. She had been sitting on the edge of her bed playing with a glob of physical therapy putty. She had held her hand out with the putty in it and was opening and closing her hand when the putty appeared to jump in an arc-like fashion out of her hand and fall almost to the floor, shoot backwards towards her bed, and then disappear into thin air. The same evening, we had a picture go missing from a wall in the back of her bed. We, my husband, daughter, and I went through her room with a fine-tooth comb and could not find either item. We searched the closet, dressers, under the beds, and in every nook and cranny. We did this several times in the next few days and found absolutely nothing. Two weeks after this incident, I was going through a box of pictures under my daughter's nightstand when I lifted the box up to open it. And there, underneath it, was the picture that had just been taken, just a few feet from the wall where it had vanished from. Almost three weeks later, my daughter found the putty, melted to the floor, under her bed where we had searched many times and had come up empty-handed. If you hadn't been there, you would think that these things were all logical mishaps, things we overlooked, but these things have happened so often that we know differently. It's almost as if they want you to doubt your sanity, In the end, it's better to have a sense of humor about these things than to take them too seriously. I'm afraid they would just feed on our fear and become very strong if we allowed it. The house itself is a rental home. We've been here for many years. I've researched the history of the house and it appears on the lot for the first time in 1911. There have been two deaths in the home, that of a 38-year-old woman who died of some long illness in 1936 and also a 68-year-old man who died here in 1961, also of a lingering illness. I've talked to a girl who lived here the longest, and she said she only had one experience in the home in her 13-year stay. She said she saw a man at the top of the stairway when she was six years old. There are many other things that have happened to us and still do happen. Maybe I will share them with you at a later date. Wow, Brenda, that is an incredible range of experiences that you have shared with us in your home. I appreciate you sharing that story with us. Uh, Let's look at some of the things that you had going on in your home. You had shadow animals. You have shadow people, which are both of those kind of disturbing on a whole nother level. You had footsteps. You had door knocks. You had phantom voices, which 
manifested in the form of family members and friends, which is disturbing. And then to top it all off, you have phantom smells, which I have always been kind of fascinated with specifically. The shadow animals are often indicative of some more malevolent forces, and I don't want to scare you. I don't want to say, oh, look, you have a demon in your house or anything like that because I'm not there. I cannot really say what you do or what you do not have in your home, but I can tell you that in almost every dark entity manifestation I have ever experienced, it has been accompanied by shadow animals, usually in the form of puppies or kittens. And there have also been instances where you also have shadow people, which some people say they're not really hauntings, that shadow people are an entity unto itself outside of hauntings. Uh, Some people think that they are manifestations of spirits. Some people think they're manifestations of demons. Not really sure, but I do know that we do see them from time to time. The fact that this started, as best you can recall, when... You answered the door to a small knock when nothing was there. That's kind of um, it's kind of not a good thing, and not that you are by any stretch to blame for that because you answer the door. It's not a big deal, but apparently you might have let something in accidentally, not really intending to, especially when you consider that the black cat started appearing pretty much immediately after that. Um, the the thing that bothers me the most is the shadow beans. Uh, that is seems like an escalation. And, and as you said, it started off slowly and worked its way up, which we see a lot of times in more malevolent hauntings. Uh, a lot of times something will start up small. And just as like you said, you kind of test the water. You stick your little toe in there and see what the reaction is going to be. And if it's going to be a reaction that you can feed off of, then maybe you build up and you build up and you build up. The other thing that you see in that that is uh, indicated in your case specifically is you see a separation of family members where the the entity will show itself to one group and not to another and it literally will make the people in the house doubt each other and what it's looking for is it's looking to build animosity because animosity uh gives it an energy source that it can feed off of and it also makes it less likely that it's going to be gotten rid of because you for you to get rid of things you kind of have to have a lot of unity and if you have animosity between family members obviously you're not going to have unity you're not going to have the strength to actually kick something out and fortunately in your case everybody has witnessed this everybody's experienced one or more aspects of what is going on so you don't really have that confusion that animosity anymore which is great uh on your part uh, the most intriguing thing to me in my own uh, special little corner of aha, uh-huh, this is this is kind of neat, is the phantom smells. The reason phantom smells are so perplexing to me is that the way your olfactory nerves, the way you, the way they work, the way you actually smell things, is you have to have if you smell chocolate cake. The way you smell chocolate cake is actually a molecule of chocolate cake gets separated from that cake, and it becomes airborne. And you breathe in that molecule of chocolate cake where it attaches itself to an olfactory nerve in your nasal passages, and you actually read it almost like a file, and your brain says, oh, we know what this molecule is. This is chocolate cake. And so you say, oh, yes, I smell chocolate cake. So for a haunting to manifest itself as a smell, one of two things has got to happen. Either that haunting has got to be so telepathically or psychologically uh, invasive that it affects your brain and tricks you into thinking, oh, I'm smelling this when there's no smell present, or the haunting is so strong that it is actually creating molecules in there it's actually creating a physical item that you can register as a smell which is a whole nother level of creepy (laughs) when you think about it because that means that whatever it is that you're dealing with can create things out of thin air 
and not only in your case, obviously it can make things disappear because it made your daughter's stuff disappear and reappear, but then it can also whole cloth make something that didn't appear there in the beginning, such as cigarette smoke or cigar smoke, which are two completely different smells, or uh, the smell of flowers. It's not the kind of thing that, now, I assume, of course, in this case, that you or your husband or none of your family members are smokers, uh, the way that you've written it. So it's not something that would be able to just appear because, oh, my husband was smoking a cigar in the living room last night, and I'm just catching a whiff of something that's lingering. This is something that's just appearing out of nowhere. So that's, um, you know, that's the whole area of you're getting into metaphysics there that uh, I could probably go on for quite a while. Uh, I won't on this episode. I might hit that later on in a different episode, but it's a lot of things that happen in your house. A lot of fascinating things. Uh, You say you had a lot more experiences. I would love to hear about them if you would like to share them with us. But for right now, I appreciate what you did share with us. And it was a tremendous story. Thanks a lot, Brenda. Well, guys, that is going to do it for us for this episode of True Paranormal, the podcast. I would like to thank uh, Steve and Carrie and Brenda for sharing your stories with us. Uh, Remember, guys, if you would like to share your stories with us, just look at our Facebook page, uh, True Paranormal, the podcast, and hit that like button. Hit the email button, which is right there, and shoot us an email. Let us know what you've experienced. We'd be glad to share your story on a future episode. Or if you'd like to message us, you can message us too. Whatever. We're easy to get along with, guys. Uh, We are trying to make sure that, you know, we, again, we've had, and I spoke about this on the last episode, we're trying to make sure that we're protecting people's anonymity at all times. So we're only going to be as detailed and as personal as you want us to be. So no fear there, no judgment. We take everything at face value and examine exactly what you share with us. And I always assume that everybody is 100% honest with us because that's how I would want to be with folks. Looking forward on the next couple of episodes, I think we're going to be going into drilling down deeper into the definitions of certain topics that are on this show. We've had a lot of you guys ask questions and I'd love to answer them as far as what is a ghost? What is a residual haunting? What is a poltergeist? What is a demon? What actually causes a house or an object to become haunted? Why is it that one house could be haunted and the house right next door to it nothing are these people that are sensitive or is it the properties more sensitive or what actually is the cause behind a lot of these things and we're going to look into some case studies on things and hopefully you guys will enjoy it's going to be a little more educational which is part of our goal here we don't want to just entertain we also want to educate folks as to what they're actually experiencing so that you can help to deal with it a little bit better. You know, knowledge is power. And if you know that, hey, this is what's causing this, then maybe you can help find a solution, either for yourself or for some other folks that around you that might be experiencing stuff. But that is going to be on our next couple of episodes. But in the meantime, you guys keep sending your stories in. We are definitely going to keep sharing stories as often as possible. I just really wanted to get into some education stuff, too. So hopefully that stuff doesn't bore you guys. If it does, let me know, and we'll dock it off. We'll just do stories and have fun with that. But at any rate, that is going to be our next couple of episodes. In the meantime, thank you guys for... uh, for joining us this week and every week again thanks you guys for sending your stories to us and join us next week for another episode of true paranormal the podcast <laughs>